Good morning, class. This is Mr. Harris with your civics lecture for this week. And this week we are looking at the judicial branch. I want to thank those students who are taking the time to listen to this and getting to learn something. I put in a lot of effort to make these videos, and I'm glad some of you guys are enjoying it. So our target is to understand the role and function of the judicial branch. So a little bit of review. We've already learned about the legislative branch and the executive branch. The legislative branch writes the laws. They are ones that actually craft the laws. If you remember our mock Congress, right, we, we did right before spring break, that was us actually creating and writing these laws as the legislative branch. The executive branch enforces or executes the laws. Now that we've created the law, it's time for the executive branch to carry it out. Recently, we passed this large stimulus package um, by the legislative branch, and then it becomes up to the president, the IRS, to distribute the funds from that law. So what does the judicial branch do? They interpret and define law. Okay, This involves hearing individual cases and deciding how the law should apply. That's usually how we think about it. And we have to remember the concept of federalism. That means power is split between a central government, the federal government, and then state governments as well as local governments. So we have federal courts for federal law and state courts for state laws. This is our checks and balances of the U.S. government. And this is something we should be familiar with by now. We have the executive branch, and although they're not the most important branch according to the Constitution, they kind of are the lead branch these days. We see President Trump being represented there. And then we also got our judicial branch and then our legislative branch. And each branch can block the other branches from doing too much. So, for example, if President Trump declares an emergency presidential order that goes against one of our uh, constitutional freedoms, the Supreme Court can declare his presidential act unconstitutional. Now, the president, though, does get to pick judges when one passes away or leaves that job. However, those judges have to be approved by the Senate. So that's one way the legislative branch can check the judicial branch. The judicial branch can also declare laws themselves unconstitutional. So we see this, this checks and balances playing out time and time again. Now, where do the court's jurisdiction come from? So in our constitutional, Article 3 says that they create one Supreme Court and such inferior courts created by Congress. So Congress creates the system underneath the Supreme Court. Now, in our federal system, so again, this is just the national system, we've got three major steps. We've got our lowest courts, which are called the district courts. Above the district courts, we have the Court of Appeals. And then finally, we got the big daddy, the Supreme Court. Now, there are 91 different district courts around the country, and each one has one district court federal judge. Then we have our Court of Appeals. There's only 12 appellate courts around the country, and each one has three judges serving on it. And then finally, the big daddy, Supreme Court. There's only one of them, and the Supreme Court has nine judges. If we look at our country of how we're divided up, um, here in central Illinois, we are in the 7th Appellate District, okay? And then you see that ILM, Illinois Middle, that is one district as well with one judge inside of it, okay? And we should be familiar with this because we actually do have that courthouse here in town. You can see the 9th Appellate Court is the biggest one and covers the entire West, Okay, and then I love this map because it also shows us that Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands are also part of the Ninth District, although we have our own special federal court on the CNMI where I used to live. So we have the United States District Court for the Central District of Illinois, and this includes Peoria, Rock Island, Springfield, Urbana. They all have courthouses in this district. And then our local judge um, in charge of all this is Judge Bruce, who is originally from Urbana. I could not prove if he went to Urbana High School or not, but he is from the community. Now, jurisdiction, which means the authority of a court to hear and decide on a case. What courthouse does your case go to? So we've got four different types of jurisdiction. We've got exclusive jurisdiction. Only the federal court has authority to hear the state court. 
I want to go back to this jurisdiction for a second. Okay. And this can come up when a crime is committed. And were you on state property or were you on federal property? Here in Illinois, it is considered legal to possess, if you're an adult, um, cannabis. But if you want enter a federal park, then you're on federal jurisdiction and is no longer legal. So sometimes these jurisdiction questions come up in that fact. Who gets to pick judges for the federal government? The president gets to nominate someone to become a federal judge. Almost always these are former lawyers who they are picking. They're knowledgeable. Sometimes they're former constitutional professors, like Obama was himself. Once the president's picked a judge, the Senate majority is supposed to vote to confirm that judge, and then the judges serve for life. Now, I put Sad Obama there because we'll talk a little bit later on about a time he tried to pick a judge and the Senate said no. Now, why do we let um, judges serve for life? Well, the founding fathers wanted an independent judiciary. They didn't want the judges to think about the voters when they were making their decisions. So there is definitely some benefits to that. There's also some negatives. If a bad judge gets in there, you can't impeach him, but that's very, very rare. Okay. They didn't want the judges having to listen to the politicians. and They want to be on their own. I also think back then people didn't live as long. So lifetime employment, what's that, like 20 years? Okay, um, little jokey joke. District court, this is the lowest one. And this is probably, if you ever commit a federal crime, hopefully you won't, this is where you'll end up. It's the biggest trial court in the system. Okay, and we have these 94 different districts divided geographically. And it hears both criminal and civil cases. And at this point in time, I want to pause for a second and talk about the difference between criminal law and civil law. So civil law has to do with financial and contract disputes. It also do about money. Criminal law is where you can actually lose your freedom. So criminal law is a system of law concerned with punishment of those who commit crimes. When you think about the law, you usually think about criminal law. If the police are involved, you are dealing with criminal law. Criminal law can send people to prison and in the criminal law system, if you have a jury trial, you have to be shown to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So if you could potentially lose your freedom or even be executed, it's best that you are shown that, no, this person is for sure guilty. Which brings us to a case that can help illustrate the difference between criminal and civil law. The man you see before you, you may recognize or you may not, his name is Orenthal James Simpson, a.k.a. O.J. Simpson, a.k.a. The Juice. And O.J. was one of the most famous men in America. He was a legendary running back um, in the NFL and in college, and he was also an actor, a comedic actor, and a national spokesman. Then, in the early 90s, his ex-wife ended up being brutally murdered, along with her fiance, or excuse me, her boyfriend at the time. Um, Almost all the evidence pointed to O.J. being guilty. They had a criminal trial. O.J. had an all-star of lawyers protecting him, including a legend you see on the right-hand side there, a man named Johnny Cochran. And Johnny Cochran was his head attorney, and Johnny Cochran was able to craft the idea that O.J. had been framed by the L.A. Police Department. He was able to convince the jury that there was reasonable doubt that O.J. did not, in fact, brutally murder these people. So the jury thought there was reasonable doubt, and they said, O.J. is not guilty. This, this court case also contained the infamous line, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit, in which O.J. attempted to put on the gloves that were allegedly used in the murder, and at the time they would not fit his hands. I'm not going to say anything else. Now, civil law is the system of law concerned with private relations between members of community rather than criminal, military, or religious affairs. When you are being sued, you end up in civil court. And in civil court, there's a lower tolerance for guilt. It can cost you money, but not freedom. Your neighbors chop down one of your trees that's on your property line, you take them to civil court. You're not going to have them arrested for that. And after... OJ was found not guilty in a criminal court. The family of one of his victims sued, excuse me, alleged victims sued OJ in a civil court 
and actually won the judgment. That jury decided there was reasonable evidence to assume OJ was guilty of the murder and he would have to pay the family millions and millions of dollars. Now, OJ um, um, declared bankruptcy and he actually has a pension from the NFL, which cannot be touched by these lawsuits in the state of Florida. So OJ actually does live free today in Florida and does not pay this family any money. Okay, so let's move on to our Supreme Court. And this is known as the court of last resort, the highest court in the country. You may have heard someone say, I'm going to take it all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, that person is probably obnoxious, but that is how this works occasionally. Okay. And it has the power of judicial review. That means they have the power to declare acts of government unconstitutional, just eliminating them. This all originally comes from the case of Marbury versus Madison. So if tomorrow um, President Trump came on TV and said, from here on out, America is a Christian country, the Supreme Court should go, ah, ah, ah. no, not allowed to do it, unconstitutional, we have freedom of religion, you can't do that. So executive orders or even laws, okay, can be declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, okay? This very most famous court case, Marbury versus Madison, that happened in 1803, um, I'm not going to get into specific details because you guys are supposed to research this, but it pretty much said, yes, Supreme Court can review court cases, can review laws passed by the government. Um, could also determine if those things are allowed or not. We also have this called McCullough versus Marison, Maryland, excuse me, another very famous Supreme Court case, which said federal law trumps state law. Okay. It also says Congress can do lots of things that are necessary and proper to ensure the good well-being and welfare of the nation. So one way you can usually get to the Supreme Court, let's say that you start in the district court. You know, okay, your court case and you think a mistake has been made or there was a there was a procedural error or something was not being um, properly looked over. You can appeal your court case. Now, the Court of Appeals does not have to listen to your court case, but maybe the judges think something did go wrong in your court case will allow it, okay? You go to the Court of Appeals, maybe they still don't decide in your favor. Then you can petition the Supreme Court to hear your court case. They don't have to hear your court case. Very few cases ever end up before the Supreme Court, but the ones that you do normally concern constitutional issues. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of them. One of the more famous ones recently was about gay marriage, okay, which a number of people had gotten married in a state that allowed gay marriage, then moved to a new state which did not count their marriage and would not give them the tax breaks and reliefs as well as the insurance things. So those groups all sued. Eventually, the Supreme Court was willing to hear that case. Now, this can also go a different way if you end up in your state Supreme Court. Sometimes those cases are then sent to the Supreme Court. Okay? And if they want to hear it, they'll issue something called a writ of ceteroni. I'm sorry, I'm really mad at my Latin pronunciation, which means they accept a case if four of the nine justices want to hear it. Okay? Now, the Supreme Court is not like a regular trial court. It's not like they're calling witnesses and things like that. Instead, the, both sides write a brief ahead of time, okay? That's got all the key facts of the case. The judges look through at all the key facts of the case, the evidence, all those kind of things. Then each side presents for about 30 minutes. That means they stand in front of the judge, they make their argument, and the judges ask them questions. After that time, the judges then come to their decision, okay? So once the arguments are over, justices will write opinions on the case, and each justice chooses which opinion to sign his or her name to. The majority opinion, this is the important one, it must be decided by at least five justices. There's nine people in the Supreme Court. One, two, three, four, five is the majority, okay? And then that becomes precedent for how similar cases will be cited in the future. In the gay marriage case, five of the judges said, we agree gay marriage should be federally recognized, therefore automatically around the nation, gay marriage became legalized, okay? And that's the precedent they set. 
Now, this precedent can be overturned by the Supreme Court in the future, but it's extremely powerful. Okay. If you disagree, if you're one of the judges who does not agree, you can write a dissenting opinion. Okay. And later on, people can look back at these dissenting opinions and use them to overturn a decision. So infamously, the Supreme Court um, initially decided back in 1877 that segregation was good and should be allowed. And then later on, changed its mind and said, oh, no, we are wrong. Segregation is bad. So they used the previous dissenting opinions to help out with that. Okay, you also have an incurring opinion. This is when you agree with the majority, but for a different reason. Okay. And then this is important. If you have a conflict in a case, you should recuse yourself. All right. So if I am a judge and my son gets arrested for DUI, he ends up in front of me. Of course, I should not hear his DUI case. I should recuse myself. In the Supreme Court, sometimes some of the judges used to work for the federal government. I know this is the case for Elena Kagan. She worked for Obama. So she had to actually recuse herself in a number of cases when they came in front of the Supreme Court. Okay. So here are some of the most important historical cases. I'm not gonna talk about each one of them. Again, this is gonna be some stuff that you guys will be researching for your project. Here's some more of them. Dred Scott, we just mentioned. Pleasant versus Brown versus Board. Now, in modern times, you'll often hear people talk about judicial philosophy. Okay, are they activist judges or are they constitutional originalists? So the basic arguments, okay, for both sides, let's put it up real quick, is that courts, if you're an activist, should use their power broadly to further justice. How can we make the world a better place? If the court sees an injustice, they should do something about it. And activists are usually are concerned with protecting the rights of the oppressed. In this country, it's usually the oppressed minorities. People often call liberal judges being activists. How dare you expand gay marriage? That's too much. That's going too far. That's activism. Okay? Restraint. Courts should allow decisions of other branches to stand. Judges are unelected. Branches undemocratic. So the, judge, the court should not get involved. And then the strict constructionist views. What did the framers of the Constitution intend? Okay, how did they originally understand what they're writing about? So they try to put their minds inside of people that were alive over 200 years ago who uh, lived in a very different world and say they were right. Let's try to do what they were originally thinking. And sometimes it's considered conservative. But I would argue that today you've got judicial activism on both sides where they both are definitely overstepping the bounds of the Constitution. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? That's up for you guys to decide. Okay, what did the founding fathers mean versus what is relevant today? And we see this oftentimes with um, the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. Some have taken that to mean that everyone has the right to own a gun. Others would say that is not what the founding fathers meant at all. They use words like militia. So this is coming up like, what did they mean? And how is it relevant today? Now let's talk a little bit about our Supreme Court. So there they are. Um, you might notice a couple things. Not a ton of diversity on the Supreme Court, even though this is the most diverse Supreme Court ever. Um, we will talk about Clarence Thomas in a second. He's one of only two black people ever on the Supreme Court. We got our first Latino up there. Every one of those lawyers also either went to Harvard or Yale. Okay, so there's also a lack of diversity there. And you can see they're also older. So our current Supreme Court justices, we'll start with the chief Supreme Court justice, and that is a guy named John Roberts. And he's not more powerful than the other judges. It's the chief thing, just kind of how the court is organized, more of a procedural title. His vote doesn't count for more than other people. And he was appointed by George W. Bush in 2005. George W. Bush was a strict conservative, and so is uh, Mr. Roberts. He's about 65 years old, so he's still probably going to live for quite a bit longer, and he is conservative. Although he did support Obamacare during that Supreme Court case, he considered it a tax, he still routinely is always on the conservative side. Now, I want to talk about this quickly. Who we see up there is, of course, on the right-hand side, President Barack Obama, and then the guy next to him was a 
person named Merrick Garland, who Obama wanted to be the next Supreme Court justice, a very moderate justice, okay? And then during Obama's last year in office, 2016, Justice Antonin Scalia, one of the Supreme Court justices, died. So according to the Constitution, Obama should be able to pick a Supreme Court justice. The Senate hears it. Then we have a new Supreme Court justice. Well, Mitch McConnell, who had a deep, deep, um, I'm trying to think of the right politically correct term, hatred for any and all things the Democrats want to do, decided that they should not hear Obama's Supreme Court nominee. So he decided never to have hearings of whether of voting for Merrick Garland or not. And it created a minor constitutional crisis, although the Democrats not really make a big deal out of it at the time, which I think is a, a huge mistake on their part for accomplishing what they want done. And so he held up the Supreme Court, and we only had eight justices for a while. And he was waiting for a new president so they can get a much more conservative pick. And President Trump won, and they decided, oh, we'll hear President Trump's pick. So President Trump picked a guy named Neil Gorsuch to replace Antonin Scalia. He was appointed by Trump in 2017. He's younger, so he'll be there for a while. And he is very conservative. You'll notice a pattern here. Everyone Trump picks is super duper conservative. Okay. Oh, and this guy. Then President Trump got to pick another Supreme Court justice. One of them retired. And that's a guy named Brett Kavanaugh. Brett Kavanaugh was appointed in 2018, again, very young, very conservative. And you guys might remember him because his hearing was a big deal. He had been accused of sexual assault by a woman from when he was in high school, and then another a number of other women accused him of sexual harassment and assault when they were in college with him. He, of course, had his hearing, and all the Republicans said, oh, you know what, we believe you, you didn't do anything, and he was barely approved. He got through by only the Republicans voting for him. Not a single Democrat voted for him, but he got to be the Supreme Court Justice. Okay? Yeah. Only confirmed 54-48 against, okay, at the time. Then we've got um, Clarence Thomas, who was picked to replace the only other black Supreme Court Justice of all time. However, he was appointed by a Republican, H.W. Bush, in 1991, and he's older, and he is also extremely conservative, okay? Um, his wife is also extremely conservative and involved in politics. There is actually a big deal when he was nominated because he was accused of sexual harassment as well by um, Anita Thomas, excuse me, not Anita Thomas, oh, what's her name? Anita Hill, um, in an infamous court case in the or excuse me, uh, trial in the early 90s that you can go check out on YouTube as well. Next, we got Samuel Alito, who was a President Bush appointee back in 2006. He's getting up there, and he's conservative. We've also got Stephen Breyer, who was appointed by Bill Clinton, a Democrat in the 90s. He's also older, and he is liberal. Okay. Then we've got the one that all the Democrats pray to stay healthy, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and she was appointed by Clinton back in 1993, and she is 86 years old, and she is very liberal. She's considered the most liberal member of the Supreme Court. Then we've got um, Sonia Sotomayor, who was one of Obama's appointees, Okay, and she is 65 years old, so she's getting up there a little bit. She's also very liberal as well, and she is the first Latina ever to serve on the Supreme Court, or Latina Latino, the, fir the first one of, one of those people to ever serve on the Supreme Court. We also have Elena Kagan, who was appointed by Obama. She's younger, okay, and is considered liberal. All right, guys, let's talk about our project for this unit. So the essential question we're looking at how has the Supreme Court established precedents for our rights and freedoms? So you're going to choose one of the, I think we have 28 Supreme Courses, Supreme Court cases provided for you guys to in investigate. You're going to create a brief about your case. You can use your Google Docs or slides or another way 
to communicate the findings from your research to your classrooms in a five to seven minute presentation. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to do live presentations, so I'm going to offer some extra credit if you do a recording of yourself giving this presentation. I then have a listing of all the things you guys need to have in your brief, the title of the case and the date, Okay, who are the people involved, what is the constitutional questions that led to the case, what happened, and how did it get to the court. Okay. You also need the argument for the petitioner, the argument for the respondent, the majority opinion, the legal precedent established, at least one important quote from the case, the significance, how are rights expanded or restricted, and then also make sure you include pictures to highlight or demonstrate the importance of the case. I will probably put up an example case for you guys and then make that an option for you not to do research of that case soon. Our goal for this is May 1st. I know the end of the year is coming up soon for you guys, so we only have two projects left, okay, and this is one of them. So we got two weeks to do this. I'm here to help you guys however you need to. So email me. We can set up a chat session if you guys want to. However, I can best assist you to get this project done, but this is the next thing you guys will be working on.